And we thank you for joining us for the second week in our virtual cafes. And before we get started and turn it over to Drs. Stolberg and O'Callaghan, I'd like to first ask President Vaughn to say a few words. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining. This is a series of webinars that Alliant is putting together in these strange times. We, as you know, have a lot of expertise uh, within our faculty in many areas, mental health, K-12 education, leadership, management, law, forensic studies. And part of being a public benefit university for us is first reaching out to our immediate community and being able to put our expertise together um, to help all of us. We've got a lot of uh, stress in our lives, both personally and professionally, financially, and just the unknown of the health issues that confront some of us or maybe some of our families, friends, or other loved ones. And this is a very strange time, and what better way to help bridge that, that gap that we all think about every day than to lean on and lean into our faculty expertise. So this today is actually a topic about talking to kids about times and that obviously ranges from very young children to teenagers and even adult children. I've got a couple of friends that have adult children that are in their 20s uh, grappling with uh, you know financial issues and just uh, it's amazing how you even in your older age, you lean on your mom and dad, um, you know, for input and advice. You know, what do you, what do you say to kids? And we are very fortunate again to have uh, experts right here at Alliant that write textbooks on these topics that travel around the world, at least they used to up until a few weeks ago, to give seminars and um, have other publications and research that's published on these topics. And so we'd like to utilize that and lean into them and their expertise. And so with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Dr. Cannon to lead us off today. Great, thank you. So um, I'm gonna turn it over and ask that we can share, um, is it Dr. O'Callaghan, is it your um, computer that's going to offer the presentation for us? That's okay. correct. So, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. O'Callaghan, and if, if you and Dr. Stolberg wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, and we'll get started. Absolutely. Thanks, President Vaughn and uh, Dr. Kincannon for the introduction. And uh, Ron and I are really excited to work with you all today and give you a little bit of background and information for you all who have kids, who have nieces and nephews, who work with children, and to uh, give you some coping skills some tools that you could use to help uh, your children, your friends' children, your family members understand uh, COVID-19 and how to cope with the stress that they are under right now. And it's a unique thing for a child, uh, depending on their age, like President Vaughn mentioned, you know, whether they be three years old, 23 years old, uh, understanding what this means for them and their life right now. Uh, many of them are being homeschooled, most are being homeschooled and not allowed to play in person with their friends, but what kind of workarounds can we make available for our kids and for our friends' kids and those ki children in our lives to help them cope the best with uh, the stressors that they're under right now. And again, wanna thank you all for being here. I am a child psychologist and I uh, have a small part-time private practice where I see a few kids a week. Uh, and these are topics that are coming up in the telehealth therapy I've been providing them with uh, since the last couple of weeks, since we've all been um, under the stay-at-home orders. So it's timely and it's really important for us to kind of uh, be able to share this with you all and our uh, patients. I am the program director, as well as being a child psychologist, uh, of the Clinical Psychology PsyD program in Los Angeles. It's an, one of the APA accredited doctoral programs. And I am an, also an associate professor in that program where I help students uh, mentor them on dissertation topics related to child uh, health and child psychology. So I'd um, like to hand it off to Ron for uh, his introduction and uh, to begin our presentation. Thanks, Aaron. Um, what an honor to get to do this with you today um, and to share 
these things that we share with our patients. But it dawned on me too that we're not just doing this clinical work with our patients. Um, we're doing it with our family members, we're doing it with our neighbors and our friends, that everybody's looking for advice about what to do with these kids while they're home. So I am a professor, a core faculty member in the clinical PsyD program in San Diego, and I too have a private practice. I mostly do family therapy, so I work with families mostly that have acting out children. And I've never believed that I could fix a child. I believe that I have to work within a system and give everybody in that system responsibility to make some small changes. And with everybody making small changes, we get great results from a family perspective. So I'm a pretty classic family therapist in that way. The other thing um, uh, President Vaughn mentioned um, some publications that we've done. I also am the author with my wife, who happens to be a CSPP San Diego alum, um, of a parenting book called Teaching Kids to Think. And very interestingly, we have seen a big uptick on parent resources being purchased by families now that they have these kids at home. So parents are looking for support and resources and things to do with their kids. So the timing is great. Our book um, cuts across cultures and developmental levels and has been on bestseller lists around the world. It's been on the bestsellers list in Russia, Italy, Korea, and won awards in multiple places. And it's been published in 10 different languages and a number of different markets. And uh, my wife and I have done a number of radio interviews, TV interviews, podcasts, and um, have indeed spoken in Europe um, and around the world about the topic of parenting. So very exciting to be here with our uh, Alliant family today. Thanks, Erin. So again, welcome to our virtual cafe, talking to kids about these times. Uh, these are some discussion points that we'd like to go over and uh, review with you all. And we also have uh, a list of resources at the end that we'd also like to go over with you all. So I'm gonna hand it off to Ron to start this off uh, with discussing about the importance of taking a developmental approach when talking about COVID-19 with children. Thanks. So before we get into giving too much advice, we wanted to make sure that everybody understands that there is no one, um, one size fits all approach to giving parental advice and to giving tips about parenting. And we heard from um, President Vaughn about adult children. I have a college age child, a high school age child, I know Aaron's got some little elementary school age children. Um, so um, we, we're going to come at this from a developmental approach, which doesn't stress necessarily the age of the child. It actually takes into account their emotional and their intellectual uh, development. And there certainly are 12-year-olds that are very mature and you could have an insightful, thoughtful conversation with. Um, and there are 15-year-olds that you wouldn't dare do that with. And so what we want to do is to make sure that the rest of the information that we provide and the tips that we give as we go through our discussion points, um, we want everyone to take into account a developmental approach. And so just for an example, um, we believe that there should be openness and honesty from parents, um, but that honesty should have limits and it should be based on the developmental um, age of the child. And so what that means is that a five or six year old who asks why they can't go see their friends probably gets a conversation saying something like, um, the doctors have said that there's a really bad cold going around and that people are getting sick and they've asked everybody to stay home so that everyone can stay safe and healthy, which is something that a six year old might understand. But you probably would have to say more to someone in middle school or high school especially if they are developmentally along that continuum, because they no doubt are on the internet, they're on their social media, and they're hearing all these things. And so they actually have more data than we're even aware of. 
So for those um, children in our homes that have maybe a middle school developmental level, we'd want to be honest with them so they know we're being truthful. And we'd want to tell them the things we're doing to be safe and how germs are spread and the things that they can do around the house and what's expected of them um, to stay healthy and to stay safe. Um, and then with high schoolers and college age children and even our fully adult children that have the developmental insight for it, that we make them a partner in this. And so developmentally, we need to be approaching all of our kids. And when we give advice, making sure that we frame it from a developmental approach, which takes into account not just their age, but their ability to understand the material that we're giving them with the idea that our goal is to reduce their anxiety, but make them feel they're a part of the family and they're a part of the solution. And um, when, we, when we get buy-in from the kids because they understand what we're doing and we give them a developmental, um, developmentally appropriate role in the family, we, we tend to get great outcomes. So the rest of the information that Aaron and I talk about, we always want you to take into account the developmental approach to giving feedback to kids. Thanks, Aaron. Great, thanks, Ron. And I'm going to discuss the next two points with uh, regard to parents. And we all, as parents, or if your friends are parents or your siblings are parents, uh, we all are experiencing quite a bit of stress right now as well related to COVID-19, having to shift our work to a home-based scenario. Some folks have lost jobs or who are now underemployed. Perhaps our uh, income level has changed, has decreased, and perhaps we are worried about the virus impacting us or our older parents, ourselves, uh, if we have a chronic health condition or a uh, physical disability or concern that we have, this is impacting us. And it's impacting everybody in different ways. So it's really important to know that when we're home with our kids, and when parents are with their kids 24 seven, uh, those kids, even four-year-olds, three-year-olds are really listening and hearing what we're talking about, um, how we're reacting to stress and our mood. So, you know, it's really critical, especially when we're all at home together all day long to be cognizant of how we present uh, to our children when they're around us, not to, be fake or act or pretend that everything is A-OK, -okay, but rather uh, staying calm and managing our own anxiety when, we, when those anxiety flares you know, do come up, maybe taking a break, uh, letting our partner um, or another parent, if there's one in the home, take over for the kids or uh, having them do an independent project while we take a break if we're feeling overwhelmed, rather than expressing that sense of overwhelm either verbally or non-verbally to our kids. Uh, so again, the importance of understanding and remembering that we are role models for our children is really critical at this time. Uh, you know, in addition, it's important for all of us as parents right now to be really flexible when it comes to our children. Uh, they are, it's expected for them to potentially regress. Perhaps they were really great at going to bed by themselves after five minutes of a story and you walked out of the room and let them fall asleep on their own, but now all of a sudden they are being more clingy or there's more tears or more temper tantrums. Uh, it's, it's really expected under this significant time of stress for all of us and this big change of not being in school anymore or having us home all day long with them that uh, they're going to regress and they're going to have extra emotions and big emotions. And it's important for us as parents to, and for all parents to be flexible and kind of roll with these uh, punches a little bit more. Uh, our expectations of our kids, you know, we want to make sure we keep a good schedule and of course maintain their chores and all the other expectations we had for them before. But trying to be a little bit more flexible would be really important right now because kids uh, verbally cannot always express exactly what they're thinking and feeling depending on their age or developmental level and developmental level. And so it's really critical that we, you know, when they're having a big meltdown, it's likely related deep down uh, to the, all the different changes happening around them. And they can't just say, hey mom, 
I'm really stressed right now. I'm thinking a lot about the virus and I'm thinking about my friends and my teacher. You know, a four-year-old or a five-year-old or a six-year-old might instead show that through a tantrum or throw, show that through feeling the need to be more close to you physically um, or at bedtime uh, or in other ways, like uh, behavioral issues that they weren't having anymore. So again, uh, be flexible and understanding when those things do pop up for our kids. Um, and also to remember that we are role models for them, especially always, but especially right now during this time when we're all together all the time. I'm gonna pass um, the next couple points off to Ron, if uh, you'd like to um, discuss some of these issues, Ron. Great, thanks. I think this next one's really important. A um, number of my students do trauma research and I think one of the forgotten traumas in our society is the experience of a major loss. And so this might be something that we overlook a little bit or we actually kind of selfishly think about our own losses. But as we're talking about our children, they're really losing out and they don't have the context to deal with it quite as well as most of us adults. I understand that I don't get to go to work and see my colleagues or be social or go out to dinner. I probably can make sense of that. Um, but our children not seeing their friends or um, getting to walk at graduation. We know that our students here at Alliant, there's gonna be a senior class of students that are gonna graduate. And they're likely to experience a loss when they don't have that opportunity to get to walk across the stage at graduation. Um, so losses, especially for our young kids, are a form of trauma and we really should be supporting and I'm helping them through that. Um, our children are losing quite a bit. Their days are based on seeing their friends and their teachers, and um, they are missing out on birthday parties, driver's license, graduations, all kinds of um, concerts and trips and things that they just don't have the context to understand why they have to lose those things. And they feel like it is um, something about them. They internalize it quite a bit. And they certainly just don't have the capacity to deal with those losses. So our job as parents is to be aware of those losses and support our kids through them, talk with them through it, and probably um, talk about the future. You know, as we, um, we therapists talk to our patients all the time, especially our depressed patients, they tend to dwell on their losses or the past. And one of our goals in therapy is to get people to look forward and to set new goals and to be optimistic. So we're gonna do the same thing with our kids and we're gonna remind them that the losses that they're experiencing will be something they'll get back. And we'll talk all about how we'll have a, um, a wonderful celebration for graduation or lots of opportunity to play with our friends. And, and that slides nicely into creative ways to celebrate. One of my dear friends has a uh, soon to be 16 year old daughter. Um, so in three or four days, she turns 16. And the whole neighborhood is very secretly getting together to help her celebrate her 16th birthday. And we think about these kids talk about a lost 16th birthday, a sweet 16 party with her friends, sort of the perfect time in high school, not getting to get her driver's license next week, which she would have gotten soon after being 16. And so this idea of experiencing the loss and having creative ways to celebrate. And so there will be cards and chalk art and balloons and all kinds of fun celebrations that are going to be left at their front door that she won't know about. And as we um, take our dogs for walks or go walk around the neighborhood, you're seeing all the kids out with their chalk art, drawing things and wishing people happy birthday. And so arts are it's our job as parents to be creative. We can't do the same celebrations that we might have before, but we still need to celebrate. And so it's really important to make sure there's a celebration. It'll be a little bit different. And this is time for us to be um, at our creative best and to enlist other creative people to help us do it. So we know there's losses. Um, we should acknowledge the loss and try to look forward and at the same time, find really creative ways to celebrate events that are happening. We'll be doing this with birthday parties and anniversaries, and we'll be doing it again at graduation time for all these kids that will be either graduating from 
various levels of school or scouting or various other things that they're doing that they might have some graduation party for. So it's, we can still celebrate, we just have to be creative. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Ron. And, you know, going back to parents and what our needs are right now, there are many. And in order to be, you know, good role models and to be flexible, like we mentioned before, it's really critical that we as parents take care of ourselves and engage in self-care. And the things that we normally would do for self-care perhaps are limited or not attainable right now. For example, going to a gym or going out to dinner with your girlfriends or guy friends, uh, playing poker with your buddies. You know, these are the things that uh, we like to do as parents. And, you know, it's tough because we're separated from our friends and our neighbors. We're separated from our siblings as parents and our, our parents. But there are ways to connect. Uh, you know, staying socially distanced doesn't mean we have to be socially isolated. And, you know, engaging in FaceTime conversations, uh, regular phone dates and happy hours with our friends or, uh, you know, talking to our partners and our friends and loved ones on the phone. These are really uh, essential things to help us with our social support and our coping. Uh, taking a break, I think, is a really critical, important thing that we all as parents absolutely need to do every day, maybe a couple, three times a day where uh, we take a break from the children <laughs> because they're here 24 seven. And you know you can get a headache from the sound of the iPad and <laughs> the television shows because we're all coping the way we can right now with working while the kids are home. But trying to take a 15 minute break to do some mindfulness, listen to your favorite music on your headphones, take a power walk around the block, um, whatever it may be that's your self care yoga, watching your favorite um, reality TV, anything uh, that you can engage in at least one thing a day that makes you feel alive, that makes you feel well and uh, gives you social support. That again, is not just gonna help us as human beings, but also helps us to be better parents. So um, we really recommend definitely continuing to engage in self-care. It's hard to remember uh, to do that when us, we're at, we're at home, we're washing dishes all day, we're cooking all day, we're having to go to the grocery store with all the fears, you know, wrapped up in going out to the grocery store. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stress on us as parents that are uh, really amplified right now, given that we're working at home and we're homeschooling all of our children right now. It's very stressful. But again, remembering to engage in self-care, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes a day, will go a long way. And we'll make sure that we can stay um, of sound, sound mind and body and spirit so that we can be there for our kids who need us more than ever before. Um, similarly, uh, and it's important for the family to kind of be engaging in self-care. And one way to do that, I think that's really important is to limit how much news that we're watching at home. And I know that first I did this myself, the first week that everything was happening a couple of weeks ago, the CNN was sort of in, on, you know, and I was careful that the kids weren't around, but I'm sure they caught, you know, some of what the stress was going on, you know, with the lockdown orders, with New York City, you know, um, infection rates rising every day. And it's really critical for us as parents to protect the home environment, to make it a safe place, uh, not only physically safe for them, but emotionally safe for our, our children. So really limiting or not having the news on at all while the children are awake, if you need to catch up on the news, you can do it on your iPhone or at night. But uh, really, it's important for kids not uh, to hear that regularly and often because frequently, even teenagers um, may not know how to interpret this information uh, without context, without explanation. And uh, for teenagers, however, you know, maybe they're, they're interested in what's going on. So perhaps a family half an hour checkup, you know, watching an episode of a, of a new show at night together where you talk about what you watched after. That's a way to engage uh, teenagers and older young adults uh, who, are, who are in your house to get them the right information and then to be able to discuss it, answer their questions about it, 
discuss their fears and worries openly. That's something you could do definitely with older children and teenagers. With the young ones, again, it's important to kind of limit that because the, they're not able to really interpret what all of that means. And the media, you know, can tend to get a little um, dramatic, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a television show, so there's some sort of aspect of drama. And this is all very dramatic and there's no extra drama needed. This is a very stressful, dramatic time in our history. So um, limiting how much news you watch at home is also a really way, important way to engage the whole family in self-care, keeping the home environment safe and to helping to protect our children during this time. So Ron, uh, would you like to pick up the next couple of items here on our discussion points? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Aaron. So I, uh, I'm a big believer in the next couple bullet points. Um, any parent um, is aware of the schedule. Um, we all get so excited for summer to arrive and then that lack of schedule, we're all ready for summer to be over and the kids get back to school. So one of the great things that happens at school um, is that they have a schedule. It schedules our day. We know what time we're getting up in the morning. We have a routine for breakfast, how the kids get to school. Then the school schedules the next six or seven hours of their day. And then we usually have a pretty good schedule at home. And every family does it a little bit differently. But it's organized and predictable. Kids really benefit from a schedule, they benefit from predictability, they benefit from knowing what's happening next. Um, kids inherently uh, don't do a great job of transitioning from one task to another, so schedules are a great way to do that. And part of all what all of us parents are feeling with kids at home is this lack of a schedule. The first couple of weeks, I think it was trying to figure it out and seeing how our children are going to respond and what the schools were gonna do. Um, but one of the things that I think we're all finding out is that it's important to have a schedule. Now, we get to be the people that um, develop the schedule. So it can suit our needs very well. If we thought getting up at 6.30 or seven to get to school was a little early, the schedule can start a little bit later. Um, other fun things about us getting to make a schedule is that we get to put in all the breaks we want and the schedule doesn't all have to be school time or educational or productive. The schedule can include fun time, educational videos. It can include Skyping other family members or friends or using Zoom or doing some other fun activities playtime, outside time, breathe fresh air time. So having a schedule is really important. Kids benefit from knowing there's a schedule. Schedules work best when they're posted. So posting them on some place in the, in the house where everybody sees it. Refrigerators are, are common places for people to post a schedule so that everybody knows what's expected of them and what order things are gonna happen. Now, another fun thing about us being the people that make the schedule is that we get to break the schedule. We, as parents, have to have some flexibility. One of the things you're hearing in all of these discussion points is that there has to be flexibility, times change, things change, and we need to be able to adapt the schedule um, so that's what's best for our family and our kids and us. We just heard about parent self-care. That schedule needs some time in it where the kids are doing something where we get to do our own, go outside, take a breath, relax, close our eyes for a minute, um, try, to, try to get our self-care back. So um, schedules are important. Uh, you will find that a schedule helps um, everybody transition from activities and kids knowing what's expected of them, they always respond better when they know those things. So schedules should be detailed, they should be posted, and you will benefit from developing a schedule for your kids. And remember, we get to break the schedule if we need to. So they don't have to be inflexible. And they can be pretty broad too. It can say fun time, and then each day you figure out what fun time is. 
And this really segues nicely into this idea, and I use this in my office a lot. And it's this idea that each family is allowed to have its own set of rules. I try not to tell families and parents what the rules are for them. I sometimes help families develop their, their set of rules or expectations in the family, but I never tell them what they should be. And I truly believe, um, and I think most family therapists do, that each family will develop their own set of rules and their own set of consequences and expectations and all those things that go along with having family rules. I think it's an important time for us to point out the importance of these rules because every family is dealing with this crisis a little bit differently. And some families are abiding by the rules of shelter in place very strictly and the kids don't go play with their friends and the neighbors don't come over and hang out in the garage six feet away from each other and only one family member goes to the store and that's how that family tends to deal with it but our kids are learning that not every family has the same rules right now and that in some families the kids are out playing basketball in the street with other neighbor kids or they're allowed to have one friend over at a time um, from a trusted family. And so while each family develops their own set of rules, it's important to share what those are with the children because this is in line with what the expectations are and what everybody's role is in the family. So I think what you're hearing from us today is really um, as we keep folding all of these things together is this idea that having a structure, communicating with our kids, having expectations for them, and talking to them about what their role is and how they can help the family get through this crisis is really important. And um, not being afraid to have family rules, um, I think is really an important thing for families. And your rules do not have to be the same as in other families. So each family gets to make their own set of rules. And I think that's really important especially for the kids. So um, family rules. Thanks, Erin. Great, thanks, Rowan. And you know, we wanted to also highlight and make sure we discuss families uh, of different types of makeup. So lots of families have one parent uh, in the home or uh, parents who are divorced, who share custody with their children. And so there's a lot of different unique family makeups right now. Maybe there's grandparents living in the home during this quarantine period and they weren't before because they need to be around uh, caregivers that can take care of them uh, and keep them safe and healthy and well-fed and um, made sure that they're being taken care of. Uh, there's families that have a wide range of multiple children in the home. so. For example, ranging from four to 18, I have some friends who have had kids later in life and have teenagers and stepchildren and step family makeups. So, you know, there's not one size fits all when it comes to all of our guidance here today that Ron and I are discussing. And it's really important to take into account what your unique situation is at home. And, uh, you know, sometimes parent self care is even more critical in those scenarios where perhaps you're the only parent in the house of multiple children, and perhaps your own parents are now living in the home. There may be situations that all of us are in where we're sharing, you know, people are sleeping on the couch and there's lots of uh, people in the house that aren't typically in the house because you're quarantining together. So, you know, there's a lot of different family makeups going on in the world right now and different ways in which families are coping. And I think, you know, for these families and for all of us, one of the main uh, really important things to consider is communication, uh, boundaries, uh, you know, talking about issues that may come up with your children, explaining to them, hey, I am going to have to work today and I'm the only parent here, you know, it's just me and you guys and we're really going to have to work as a family team and really engaging your kids as a, I grew up with, this, with a single mom, so I remember these discussions well, not even in a quarantine situation, but I'm gonna ask you to help out a lot with the chores right now, and you're gonna get some new responsibilities, and to build that sense of self-efficacy with children right now for all of us, but especially for those who are living alone with their kids and they're the only parent, 
it's a unique struggle and a really significant one during this time. I give my hats off to you. And I think, you know, engaging in your self-care is key. And also uh, enlisting your kids as, uh, you know, family members that can actually take on some chores. And, you know, of course, that's appropriate for their developmental stage. But, you know, likely your kids can do a little bit more. Even at age two and three, they can clean up after themselves and, you know, they can put their trash in the trash. <laughs> and these are the sometimes we find ourselves doing a lot for our children. Uh, but right now we're all stretched so thin and especially single parents that we can't do everything for our kids. So asking them, sitting down with the family meeting and uh, similar to what Ron mentioned about posting family rules, perhaps posting family roles and duties. Uh, and this is something that we all could do. And this also builds self-confidence. Self it makes them feel important and engaged in the family. And so uh, these are just some of my tips and guidance and acknowledgement of the extra stressors that certain families are under at this time. Ron, did you want to add anything to that by any chance? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think Alliant does such a nice job of opening our arms to every kind of family that's imaginable. And I really want to make sure that this is um, really generalized out there. There are families that have um, special needs children at home. So caregiver burnout becomes a real big um, thing for families to worry about. And so parent self-care, one of our earlier discussion points, becomes extra important because they may not have the same ability to have that child at school or some of the in-home support. There are families, as you mentioned, all kinds of different families, but families um, that have experienced divorce where kids are going from one home to another during this. Um, and the expectations and the family rules may be different in those homes. So those are, those are things that as parents, we really wanna be cognizant of. Um, and then finally, our own, you know, we're approaching this as if uh, we parents have lots of ability and resources and insights. But there are a lot of parents right now struggling with their own anxiety and depression and they're home with kids being more of a caretaker than they might have been normally. And so that idea that there's stress and tension and pressure in the home and that when one member of the family takes it out on the others, it becomes a vicious cycle within the home. So I just, I just wanna acknowledge all the different kinds of families um, that might be um, trying to parent under this really difficult situation. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Ron. And so here we have a few more slides that really cover some resources for you all. And the Children's Institute is an organization here in Los Angeles that provides outpatient uh, mental health services to children in the LA County area. And their website has compiled a really great resource list with activities, information for families. So uh, I would, I, I have used this countless times in the past two weeks for myself as a parent, for my, I've sent this whole website over to all of my clients that I work with, all the parents via their emails. And I've talked and used some of the activities with my patients when I'm doing telehealth with them, uh, some of the child patients and teenage patients I work with. So it's a great uh, resource for us as psychologists, but also for parents directly. Uh, this is a wonderful resource. And so I would definitely urge you all to go to that website and uh, check out the resources and the compilation of resources they've compiled there. This is another resource that is uh, it's called dreamaplay.com. It's actually uh, the person, the people who created this uh, checkup and toolkit are actually two good friends of mine. I went to graduate school with Dr. Zaka here who created this uh, resource. But it's a way for you as parents to help your children, you know, take a pause throughout their day, you know, and it's sort of like a mental health checkup, you know? So the instructions are really, are really fun and interesting. Uh, I think this is something you could use and it's on the website. You could print it or just have it on your iPad screen or your phone screen or whatever for your kids. And this is for kids who, you know, are elementary school age typically where, you know, it's asking your kids to take a pause, take a time out. How do you feel right now? It's sort of teaching our children that, uh, you know, to just listen to how we're feeling, to 
take a time out to really understand what our emotions are. And then depending on how you feel, you know, you could use distraction techniques if you're feeling stressed or worried or upset right now. And that means you could go hang out with your pet, go have a FaceTime conversation, make a craft, listen to music, play a board game with your family, or how about going outside, getting some exercise, taking a walk around the block? Uh, you know, is there something you could do like taking some, you know, taking a snack, maybe your child is hungry and they aren't even realizing that. So going to get, uh, you know, a granola bar and uh, some, some healthy snacks and some water. Um, is there something that they can think about right now? Uh, what are their dreams? What are some good things that can happen right now? How can I see these things differently, the things I'm stressed about? And then finally, you know, helping your child learn how to relax, do deep breathing, take slow breaths. Uh, you know, I always teach my clients to take a breath in for four seconds and then out for four seconds. It's like in for four seconds and then out for four seconds. Even just spending 30 seconds breathing um, with them in that way is a really uh, great way to slow them down help them focus and to decrease heart rate and decrease anxiety. Um, so these are some, this is a great little image that I've uh, found really useful so far with my clients that could help you as a parent as well. So Ron, did you wanna maybe discuss this next couple slides here? I wanted to say um, thank you to Curtis. I see that he is posting some of these links for us. And what we have done is put together some of the ones that we use um, but there is no shortage of links available to parents. So you could certainly use these. Um, I, I love the one that Aaron just shared. Uh, lots of resources. So um, yeah, the, oh, there we go. Um, so helping children cope is a, um, a great thing to do. And again, we have this idea that we're doing our interventions with children and our kids at a developmental level. And so they group things here by age groups. And so what are some things that a preschooler might be dealing with? Um, um, well, certainly the change of schedule and picking up on all our anxiety. Preschoolers don't need words to know that our, their parents are stressed. So they're gonna feel that there is stress and tension and anxiety in the air. And the ways that they show that, remember our preschoolers aren't great verbally, they're, they're awfully verbal, but they're not great at communicating really what's going on inside of them. They're probably not even very aware of it, but they know they're anxious. And so they have bad dreams, or we see some regress, regression in some of their developmental tasks like speech. We might even see regression in terms of bedwetting, those types of anxious things, change in appetite. Preschoolers are, Maybe if they've been doing good independent sleeping, may want to be back in our room with us if they sense anxiety and tension. So really, again, this is such a great chart because it reminds us that each sort of developmental level of kids will be expressing their reactions differently. And so sort of this elementary school age kids, we see the irritability, um, aggressiveness, some of that joining us in our rooms again at night, appetite difficulties, um, our kids are um, psychosomatic. They, they convert psychological um, tension to physical pain. And so they will have upset stomachs and headaches and not be able to sleep. And those are all signs for us um, that, that our children aren't coping quite as well as we hope they would. And we should expect some of this. And charts like this are so great. Um, because it helps you kind of go look and see developmentally ways that kids are expressing themselves. And as you see the adolescence, we start getting, um, we continue with the, the um, somatic symptoms, the physical symptoms, the headaches and the sleep problems, the decrease in energy, um, apathy. The kids are really motivated by getting up and going, doing things that are fun and stimulating to them. And when they don't have that, they sort of lose their momentum to do it. Um, we will um, really want to keep our adolescents engaged socially. It just has to be done differently. So we really want to encourage sort of virtual play dates and get togethers. Um, 
One of the interesting things in this generation is that it used to be in the good old days that you'd open your garage door or someone would ring your doorbell and there'd be kids outside that wanted to play. And today's generation of kids may not do that quite as much as they used to, but one of the places they play with each other is online. And so we may see that they really need this online connection and that they're playing video games together. Certainly we worry about screen time with our children. That's one of our, that's one of the most common things I get in my clinical practice is how much screen time is, is too much. And during these times, our children may actually need some screen time, especially if they're engaging with their friends. So these charts um, from the National Child Trauma Stress Network are really beneficial to help us see that our children probably aren't capable of coming to us, tapping us on the shoulder and saying, I'm anxious and nervous and there's some things I wanna share about how I'm feeling. We just can't expect our kids to be able to do that. Um, so this is, um, this is the way we're gonna see the symptoms that they're not coping and that we need to work a little bit harder to bring some of these supports into their life and deal with it. Wonderful resource. Great, thank you, Ron. And here are two other additional resources for you all. And I wanted to highlight the COVID-19 storybook and activity book, and I'm gonna shift to that right here. You can see it on my screen. And this is for younger children, uh, definitely maybe older preschool, younger elementary school. But you can see here that this is a little workbook that you could print or that you could do together on the computer. Um, it explains what the coronavirus is. It shows with lovely pictures and drawings, how it travels, how it transmits itself to people. Um, and then it engages the child about it and it's their child's understanding about COVID-19 as well as how they're feeling about it with these classic, you know, uh, emoji, original emoji faces here. And then it asks the child to draw how they feel And then it kind of, you know, relates the adults to the child as well and says, we understand how you're feeling, but um, let's explain more um, about COVID-19, um, what it means, what it looks like, and the reality of it, um, what it actually does to the body. So it, another resource that you could use. Um, it also gives some education about hygiene and sanitation here. Um, so this is just one of the resources and the website here on uh, this PowerPoint is where you can find it. So we wanted to open it up as well for questions. If you all, we have um, only about 10 more minutes, but uh, we'd love to hear from you all if you have any questions for uh, myself or Ron about how, uh, you know, to help your children cope with and understand COVID-19 or your family. And we'll open it up for that. And I wanted to mention that I've just posted our email addresses. So if people have to step out, or didn't get a chance to ask a certain question, they certainly can reach out to either of us um, back channel through email. So happy to, happy to talk to people and connect with them that way too. Great, thanks Ron. I, I just also would like to mention, um, and thank you Dr. Silver and Oak Callahan, uh, we will be posting the presentation portion of this, which we have been recording onto the website. So you will have access to that, um, we will not post the discussion portion that we're about to enter into. There's a comment in the chat thanking for the resources um, that were provided, which are indeed wonderful and very useful. You're welcome. And the, like I said, the Child, uh, the Child Institute website is really great because it, there's like 40 more resources on that website. Uh, we have a question that reads, hello, you mentioned about online playdates for kids. I want to know how often my kids need it. I have two six-year-olds and they need it multiple times a day. <laughs> so it depends on your child, I think. I Sometimes the desire comes from them and it's usually with online video gaming, to be honest, as Ron mentioned. I have boys who are really into Minecraft and Roblox, if you guys know those apps, <laughs> uh, they're my world right now. So, you know, whatever your child is interested in, I feel like setting up a play date 
uh, with your uh, kids, friends from school that they don't get to see very often anymore is a great idea. Another way I've done it is setting up a FaceTime interaction between the kids, which because my boys are only six, I have to really be involved in facilitating the back and forth communication between their friends and them for about five to 10 minutes. And what I've discovered is that they'll grab the iPad then and run outside with their friend to the backyard. And then, then, then they all of a sudden have their own conversations if they're really silly and funny to listen in on. But it, at, even for five minutes to connect or three minutes, if that's all it is that they get is to see the kid's face and laugh and be silly and say something, uh, anything to each other, it's going to be great for them to get that connection. I, I don't think it has to happen every day. My kids like to play the video games with their friends every day, so that's why it's a lot for me. But every family's different. And I would, uh, you know, listen to what your kids are asking for and try to kind of go out of your way to find that classmate's email on the class. I had to go to a class page to find a mom's email. And I had to really take a lot of extra time to kind of navigate this because I'm not friends with this mom in the real world. You know, I, we would see each other at school, but I never got her phone number. So I had to make an effort to go find the person's phone number, email, connect, set up a play date. Um, and time it, but they're still talking about, you know, connecting with their friend, Logan, who is a good kid and really they miss a lot and they don't get to see. So, um, and he doesn't play the online video games. So this was the way to do it. So I would encourage you to kind of go out of your way if possible to connect them with folks that um, they miss and that they used to sit next to in class or hang out with in the after school program. Uh, teenagers are really good at doing this on their own, but I think the young ones need that extra help and support to do that. Excellent. And along the same lines, there's a question about um, extending limits on the screen time. You had mentioned that during your presentation. How long would you recommend? So I think I mentioned that. So I'll go ahead and take this one so you, you get two different opinions. Um, one of the things I say is that I don't think there's any two kids that are the same age that really should have the same amount of screen time. Again, it's really about the individual child. And so one of the ways that we figure out how much screen time is recommended and enough is when um, you ask the child to disengage from the screen and they can't do it. That becomes one of our red flags that, that the screen time isn't just now being used for something positive, um, something to connect with friends, or maybe even educational. We're talking a lot about video games, but there's lots of um, enrichment activities that occur on screens. And for our middle school and high school kids, they're now doing homeschool on their iPads and their phones and their laptops. So they're being forced to put in a lot of hours on their screens. So in lower elementary school, we think smaller chunks are probably better. We don't want kids to engage for, you know, an hour at a time. It's probably too much. They sort of aren't paying attention anymore after that first half hour. So probably more frequently, but in shorter bursts for low elementary school age kids. And I really want parents to think um, that they should be implementing this when they think it's a good idea and the children need a break or a transition or something to uplift them and they shouldn't be depending on this as a babysitter. We, we sometimes get carried away and think of screens as babysitters for our kids. So we don't want to be kind of falling to that. Now, if as a parent we have an important phone call or a Zoom meeting we have to take that we know is going to be 20 minutes, that's a great time to kind of plug our kids into something that they enjoy doing that will distract them for those 20 minutes. And then we both get what we both get what we want out of that time. So again, I don't think any, I don't think there's really a number for each kid, but the, the big red flag is when you try to disengage and they can't, that means that they're spending too much time on and it's not really doing the positive influence on them that we're looking for right now. Thanks. Great question. We do have another chat question, however. Um, so the question is for families with split custody and the kids are anxious about switching environments with their normal custody agreement, what would you recommend? 
I'm, I'm happy to start with this one. And then Aaron, why don't you jump in too, if you have some other feedback. This is a really important question. I think this is one of those times when, um, you know, it's an extraordinary time and a crisis and parents need to be more flexible. So this is a time that when two adults who couldn't make a marriage work um, need to get together and be able to communicate and do what's best for the child. And so some of the families I'm dealing with have changed their agreements. Um, the courts certainly would support any time there's a crisis or um, a big change that uh, families are able to make these changes without court permission. So um, parents really need to put their differences aside and do what's best for the children. And if we see the kids are feeling a little bit safer and doing a little bit better and one home is better than the other, then maybe the exception needs to be made that for the time being, a little bit more time is spent at that home, that the transitions are a little bit smoother than they might normally be, the communication is enhanced a little bit better than it might be. And if a child is gonna spend some extra time at one house, that custodial parent should, should um, remember that when this crisis is over, that the parent who lost out on some time is gonna to wanna to make that up too. So really we should be thinking about fairness and what's in the best interest of the kids. It's a great time to set aside our sort of parent egos about who's the better parent or who's right and really do what's best for our kids. Erin, any ideas? I agree completely, Ron. I think communication is the biggest message. Very clear and regular communication between both households is really critical. And I have a couple clients that who, whose parents are divorced, uh, one, client is still moving between the two homes. One has decided to stay with one parent and FaceTime very regularly with the other one. So uh, the FaceTiming happens several times a day whenever the child wants to and at regular, at regular times agreed on by the parents. So I think really making sure that the rules surrounding social distancing, if at all possible, can be the same at both households to making sure that the, the schedule is pretty similar at both households and the family rules are pretty similar at both households. It may not be the case and probably isn't in the regular times, but we are in an extraordinary time right now and it calls for uh, us to support our children in a way that um, helps them keep regulated. And uh, they're already feeling dysregulated. Their lives have been completely upended, actually. So it's really critical that if they are shifting to two homes still, that it's as, with as much consistency across the two homes as possible. And communication between the parents is going to be really critical to meet that. Thank you. So we are at the top of the hour. I would like to thank Drs. O'Callaghan and Stolberg for this incredibly rich presentation. And I'd like to thank all of our participants for joining us and, and staying connected in this important way to our community. I'm grateful to you for being here and for meeting with us in this space. As I said, we'll have this presentation available and um, we will be meeting again next week when we'll be talking about coping with the financial stress during COVID-19 next week. So we hope to see you back here again and wish you a great week. And if you need anything in between, just please reach out. Okay, thank you. Have a great rest of the day.